All right, today we're going to talk about being offended by God. We're going to talk about when God offends you. And uh, I want you to see this in Scripture. This may be new to some of you, but just open your Bible, listen to what I've got to say. And I'm, I've really prayed over this. God, speak to their hearts because I want him to help you. I want him to be good to you. I don't want you to die having missed on what Jesus died to give you. I want everything God sacrificed to be yours in life, daily life and everything we do. And we're going to look at this one verse today, Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> I, I lied, one verse to start with. Matthew chapter 11, verse 6 says this, Blessed is he who is not offended by me. I want you, this, is, there is, this is the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If you can keep from being offended by him, he'll be good to you. If what he wants to do doesn't offend you, he will be good to you. What do you, do you see two things there. God wants to be good to you. If he, didn't, if he didn't want to bless you and be good to you in every area of life, listen, we don't do a God that just works on Sunday mornings. Our God is in every part of our lives. He's the one who makes our marriages great. He's the one who changes our hearts. He's the one who fills us with his peace and joy. He's the one who builds great families. He's the one who builds great businesses. He needs to be in your business life. He, he runs every part of life for good, and he wants to bless you. He wouldn't have said this if he didn't want to do it. But what stands between me and the great blessing of God? He's going to offend me. And I have to be able to get over that offense for him to do things for me. I'm going to make a statement. This is the whole Bible in one sentence, as you're going to see. It's going to be very monotonous this morning. Here it is. He will offend your head to test your heart, to see if you will trust him and obey him so he can do great things for you. That's Genesis to Revelation. He will offend your head to test your heart, to see if you'll trust him and obey him so he can do good things for you. In the particular context here, uh, in this passage, uh, let's read a little bit and see what happened here. John, uh, Matthew eleven two, 2. John the Baptist had heard in prison, he's in prison, about the works of Christ. He heard what Jesus was doing. Not about Jesus, but what he was doing. He sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? What happened? Y'all know who John the Baptist is, baptizer is? Listen to what the Bible said about John. There was a man sent by God to declare and prepare the way for Jesus. Before God stepped down to earth, he sent a prophet. And that prophet's name was John. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. His job was to come to earth and tell people, God's fixing to step down to earth. God's going to be here. He's right behind me. And I'm here to prepare the way for him. So John was a powerful preacher and God's hand was on him and people were coming into the wilderness. John was a wild man. He was strange. He lived in the woods. He wore a camel hide. He ate locust and wild honey. He was just different. But he preached and people came. And one day while John's preaching, Jesus walks up. And this is when Jesus starts his ministry. And John stops the service and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He pointed at Jesus and said, That's God on earth right there. He was the man sent by God to tell everybody, God's fixing to come to earth, and when he gets here, I'll show you who he is. That was John. All right, a few months after that, Jesus, that's the, that day is the day Jesus began his ministry. A few months after that, John gets arrested. He walks into the president's office and tells the president, it is not right for you to be having sex with your brother's wife, which it is not. I should be able to get amen on that. Well, that got him arrested and thrown in prison. So now he's in prison, and what? And John is hearing the works of Jesus. People are telling him, let me do what this guy's doing. Here's what he's doing. So John goes, wait a minute. And he calls two of his friends and says, go ask him if he's the one we're supposed to be looking for. Why did he do that? Learn from, it. Learn from Scripture here. Let me go back and tell you what John's message was. God is coming to the earth. The Messiah is coming He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff and he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's going to lay the ax to the root of the tree. John preached a message of judgment. He said, God's coming and he's going to straighten you dirty sinners out. God's coming to this earth. He's going to burn up sin. He preached a message of judgment. Well, Jesus shows up. He didn't come with judgment. Jesus shows up. He starts healing people that don't even go to church. He's raising people from the dead that didn't tithe. He's doing miracles for people that aren't good people. And John's going, wait, 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 wait a minute. 
I thought God would come down here and straighten all you sinners out. And here he is being nice to bad people. That's what happened to John. You know what happened to John? He was offended by the way God did his business. God didn't do things the way John expected him to. Let me make an announcement. He wants to do things for you in a way that you don't expect him to. And if you can get over the way he wants to do things, there's no telling what he'll do for you. Every single person in this room, he created you. It needs to be written on your heart. My, I didn't come from my mom and daddy. God created me. The only reason I'm on this planet is because he wanted me here. Acts chapter 17, he determined the day you'd be born and the place you'd be born for a reason. God put you in this earth to be good to you. He put you in this earth to be a father to you. And the tremendous blessings he's planned for you, and he paid for them with his son's death at the cross. You say, well, Brother Brown, why didn't he do more for people? Right there's the answer. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. If I'm offended by his ways, it cost me what he wanted to do. Now, I want to point out something to you from Scripture, and this needs to be one of the foundations of your life is what I'm fixing to show you, one of the foundational verses. And one of the foundational truths of your life is that God don't think like we do. No, no, I, I get amen, but why do we go out on Monday and expect Him to think like we do? Isaiah 55, turn with me to Isaiah 55. Let this be one of the greatest lessons you ever learn. Isaiah 55 is one of those great passages where he, the whole passage is wonderful, but I want to point out one great truth here. This is the great passage where he says, everybody, anything you're thirsty for, come to me, I'll give it to you. And he asked a, a great question. He said, why are you spending money for bread that doesn't satisfy? Why are you going what you're going through to try to get something and it don't work? He said, come, come to me. I'll give you everything you're looking for. And then he gives us this great truth. Get this down in your heart. Isaiah 55, verse 8. He says this, and this needs to be permanent. My thoughts are not your thoughts. What do you say right there? I don't think the way you do. You don't think about things the way I do. Do y'all understand that he doesn't think about things the way we do? All right, he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. What's the next thing he says? And my ways of doing things are not the way you do things. Was, we we got we to learn this. I expect God to do things a certain way because I learned this in church. You better lose that. My ways are not your ways. Now listen, it appears to some people that God's ways are foolish, that he is irrational. And uh, matter of fact, listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The things of the Spirit are foolishness or seem foolish to the natural person. A lot of the things he'll ask you to do look stupid. I'm going to get straight to the point. He'll just ask you to do things that look foolish. But what does the verse 9 say? My thought, I'm not irrational. I'm supra-rational. My thoughts are above your thoughts. My ways are above your ways. So what's one of the greatest prayers you'll ever pray? Here's, here's, our, here's the common American Christian prayer. Do it my way. Do it my way, Father. That's never going to get answered. Here's the great prayer from the book of Psalms. Teach me your ways. Teach me your ways. And this is the great, I often wondered why God doesn't bless some of my preacher friends like he has me. Here's the answer. You can't tell him how to do things. You have to do things the way he wants things done. Even if they seem dumb to you. I'm going to say it again. He will offend your head to test your heart to see if you'll trust the man so he can be good to you. All right? Now, we're very intellectual people, aren't we? Americans are very intellectual. We like to think things out, and we have to be able to understand it intellectually. You'll never be able to walk with God in your head. If your God will fit between your ears, you need a new one. He's bigger than that. I've had preacher friends say, well, I don't think God expects you to check your mind at the door. And I think you're dumb as a brick. Yes, he does. Let me show you another great foundational truth you need to get down in your heart. Proverbs chapter 3. You've heard this before, but let's start doing this. Proverbs chapter 3. When people say to me, well, Brother Brian, it just seems like the right thing to me. I know we're in trouble. Seems smart to me. Now we're really in trouble. I want to ask you a question. According to Proverbs chapter 3, what does he tell me to do with my head or my way of thinking? Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart 
and lean not on your own understanding. What did he just tell you right there? You better turn your mind off. You better quit thinking about the way you think about things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Quit leaning on your own. Quit, quit doing what you think smart. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Father, we're having trouble with my children. I've tried fussing at them. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He'll direct your past. If you'll ask Him about everything in life, He'll tell you what to do. Now I want you to look at this next one. This bothers people. Verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Quit doing what you think smart. Friend, you can do what you think smart or you can do what He says. And, uh, but if you won't be offended by Him, He'll do wonderful things for you. All right, let's get this down to where we live in daily life. I'm going to show you a picture of it in Scripture, and then we're going to talk about how we struggle with stuff in life every day like this. Turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Let's look at a picture of it. I love this passage right here. And you know it's got to do with fishing. Luke chapter 5. One of the th I was told back when I first met Jesus in 1975, you had to read the Bible. You were taught to read the Bible. Well, I began to read the Bible, and a guy told me, it's said, too late for the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. So I read the New Testament. You know, the first thing that struck out to me was, why is Simon in your team? Why did you let Simon be? I said, Simon's an idiot. Redneck, hot-tempered fisherman. And the Bible said he's ignorant and uneducated. Well, you don't have to read much to know he's ignorant. He's a wild man. He, he's undisciplined. He's not preaching material. He can't control. After three years of training with Jesus, he cut a guy's ear off. Simon's just wild. And I said, why have you got him on your team? And he answered me. You know what he said? These are not the type of people that church people like. These are the type of people I like to work with. And I said, get out of here. They lied to me. I've been lied to at church more than you can imagine. They should have never gave me a Bible. I'll look it up for myself. And I just am stunned that he would, he not only used Simon Simon was the chief leader of his enterprise. We wouldn't even let him speak in here. Learn about God from the Bible. It doesn't make sense, but he don't have to make sense. Since he's God and he owns a place, he can do what he wants to. All right, this is one of those great passages where you and I learn a lot from. Luke 5, it was as the multitude gathered around Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. Two boats standing by the lake. The fishermen had gone from and washing their nets. You got it? Jesus is here on this lake. A crowd's wanting to hear him teach. And there's these two boats, not wreck boats. These are commercial fishermen. Their boats are maybe 25 feet long. And they fished all night. And they're, they're done fishing. They're cleaning their nets up. Jesus is standing here. And Jesus says to him, uh, verse 3, He got in one of the boats, which is Simon, and said, Put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. I often wondered, how could Jesus speak to 5,000 people with no PA system? But he did it. Well, here's how. Uh, if you've ever been to this part of the world, the, the mountains come right down to the water, and then the Sea of Galilee is about 10 miles across both ways. Well, you know, water's an amplifier. You can be sitting on still water, and you can speak, they can hear you a mile away. So Jesus gets in his boat and says, push me back a little bit. So they push out 30, 20, 30 yards. The people sit down all across the hillside, hundreds of them, and Jesus sits in that boat and just teaches. Well, Simon's with him because Simon had to put, row him out there. So Jesus just sits in the boat. And as he speaks, the water carries his voice up there. Right, and he preaches, he speaks. He gets done. He prays, thanks him for coming. Y'all have a good trip home. Watch what happens. And uh, verse 4, when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Did God just speak to him? Right? Well, that, Jesus said, okay, Simon, t take me back to land. So Simon rose him. They get the boat, touches the, the land there. Jesus climbing out of the boat. And he, he said to Simon, said, uh, get your nets and go back. Go right over there. Go right there and put out your nets for a catch. So God's told him to do something. What's the problem? Problem's in the next verse. Simon answered, said, Master, we've told all night and caught nothing. You know what he just said to him? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Who's the fisherman here? Jesus was not a fisherman. Jesus was a preacher. Who's the fisherman? Simon's a commercial fisherman. He knows how to fish. He just fished all night, didn't catch nothing. So what's this about going out here now? All right, you wouldn't know this unless you lived there. 
You don't fish during the day there. These are not rod and reel fishermen. They're net fishermen. They throw nets. Why can you not fish during the day? Fish see the nets. That, that water in that lake, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, it's crystal clear. Like You can see a dime laying on the bottom of the lake. Well, if you fish during the day and you throw a net, the fish going to say, Bubba, the net's coming, and they're going to go like that. That's why, you, that's why you fish at night. Let me ask you a question. If you do it the expert way and you fish all night and catch nothing, do you really think you're going to catch anything during the day when they can see you coming? That's why, Jesus, that's why Simon said, we, we fished all night and caught air. You know what Simon said? You better stick with preaching I'm a fisherman. And what you said is so dumb. Right, let me ask you a question. Why would God ask you to do something that's dumb? And this is dumb. All right, let, me, let me help you here. Last Monday, I'm fishing in the middle marshes behind Harker's Island out there. And I'm fishing. And uh, suppo- this is a suppose. This don't happen to me. This suppose. Guy comes up in his boat beside mine there and he says, uh, catching anything? And I said, well, a little bit. He says, hey, hey, do this. Take the bait off your hook and throw it in without bait. I've been fishing for 60 years. Now, I'm not going to say anything because I'm a preacher, but I'm thinking in my mind, you're either drunk or you're on drugs. How many of you know you don't catch fish on a bare hook? Are you with me? So I'm nice, but, and he, moved, he goes on and I'm thinking, that's stupid. And it, is really, it really is stupid to try to catch fish without bait. But there was something in that guy's voice. So I look around and make sure nobody's watching. I pull that gulf shrimp off that jig head. And I set a North Carolina state record for flounder. Where'd he go? I got to talk to that guy. That's exactly what happens here. God asked Simon to do something that was so dumb and so futile. And he's telling a man he's an expert. What's these words? And let's learn to say these words. Let's read five again. Simon answered, said, Master, we fished all night, toiled all night, caught nothing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down a net. What you said makes no sense to me. What you said will not work. But because you said to do it, I'm going to do it. That's called great faith right there. What? But this, this is hilarious to me. I saw this on a video once. It's real good. Verse six, when they had done what Jesus said, they caught a great number of fish. Their nets are busting. They signaled to their partners in the other boat. Who are their partners? James and John. They were in business together. They hollered, get your boat out here. Well, James and John had been sitting on the shore laughing at them. If I saw somebody fishing with that bait, I'd laugh too. They ain't laughing now. Said, get get out here. So they bring the boat and they came and filled both boats and both boats are going under the water. They're so full of fish. I mean, they're just, just, with their hands, they're just heaping the fish in these boats and they, they almost sank the boats. All right, let me ask you something. Do you think God had something to do with that? Do you think they just got lucky? That's God. Now, here's the big deal. Here's the the big deal. They weren't recreational fishermen. They're commercial fishermen. They do this for a living. And what did Simon say? We fished all night, caught nothing. My business is failing. He couldn't pay the rent. He couldn't buy groceries for his children. You don't catch fish, you don't feed your family. His business was suffering terribly. Simon is a dumb, foul-mouthed redneck. He's not following Jesus at this point. But God Almighty looks at him and smiles and says, I'm going to help his business. Just for the sake of me, I'm going to be good to that man. So in one day, he turns his business completely around. He goes from no money to the biggest payday of his life, biggest catch of his life. Now he's got plenty of money. Who did it? God wants to work in every area of your life, everything. But what did Simon have to, what had to happen before Simon could be blessed? He had to get over being offended. This sounds so stupid. And matter of fact, I'm going to get laughed at if I do this. You know, if you fish without bait, your friend's going to laugh at you. Let's reach a place in our lives where we're really not that concerned about what people think about us. Now be good, don't be, don't be hateful, but let's live for an audience of one. Let's make up our minds, whatever he says. And God turned this man's business around in one day and worked a miracle for him. He didn't deserve it because he would listen to him, even if it was foolish. Let me show you where we want to live. Look at this. And when Peter saw it, verse 8, 
When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me. I am a sinful man, O Lord. He just got saved right there. Now, do you really think he wanted God to get out of his life? No, no. I've, been, I've done this before. He's just overwhelmed with the kindness of God. I don't deserve your goodness. I, I'm a sinner and you've given me all this. We want to live like this. Then as I was taught when I first got saved, go to church, try not to cuss, and don't listen to Led Zeppelin no more. And that was it. And give money. That was it. That's a pretty boring life right there. I want to live seeing God doing things. I want to live seeing God doing things for my family. I want to live like, well, let me, I got to show you the next verse too. Verse 9, he and all who were with him were what? Astonished. I want to live my life going, God did that. I want to live my life saying only God could have fixed that. God gave us that. I want to live my life astonished by the goodness of God. But can you see in that passage right there, what does a person have to do to see God's hand working in their life all the time? What do you have to do? You have to not be offended by what he says to you, even if it's ugly or if it sounds dumb. Are you with me? The simple message this morning, if you won't let him offend you, you'll live like this right here. I don't believe anything's changed. I was told when I went off to school to learn how to preach or how not to preach. I was told that God did great things then, but he don't do great things now. Then what are we doing in here this morning? I don't believe that. I don't believe he's changed one bit. I believe God can fix hurt everywhere it's at. He can fix our families. He can bless us tremendously. I believe we're supposed to see miracles all the time. I've had people get ugly with me and say, you're a miracle chaser. Amen. You, you got a problem with that? Because he's a miracle working God. I mean, we, I need help. We need help. There are things I can't handle. And one of the things you have to do to be blessed by God is to admit you can't handle it. Now, if you're one of them people, I don't need no help. I'm great. Good luck by yourself. I told a guy he was an he's athlete, very stout, you know, he very right here. One of them guys, you know, he's just so proud of himself. I said, Do you realize you're just a few days away from ringing a little bell, hoping an orderly will bring you a bedpan so you don't pee on yourself? <laughs> you ain't near as stout as you think you are, because Father Time and Mother Gravity are gonna catch you one day. There was it, this is the greatest, this is the message of the Bible. I was taught when I went to church, if you'll be good, God will be good to you. No, if you'll believe, if you'll trust the man, he'll be good to you and he'll do things for you. I, I love this passage right here. This is one of the greatest. Now listen to me. This is not a history book, although the history is accurate in it. This is not so we can read about Simon and say, well, ain't that good for Simon? The Bible is God speaking to you. The Bible is God Almighty speaking to you. And what's he saying right here? If you'll listen to me and do what I tell you, even if it offends you, you'll see me do this kind of stuff in your life. I'll work miracles for people that just listen to me. Let me say it again. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. Blessing means God steps into your life. He does things for you. He does little things for you. He does big things for you, just like you do for your children. Let's memorize this verse here in Luke, Luke chapter 11. If you being evil as a father, well, I am not an evil father. You ask my children, I'm good to my kids. Matter of fact, I'm too good to them sometimes. I'm good to my kids. So why does he call me an evil father there? Listen to it. If you being evil as a father compared to me and you'll give good things to your children, how much more will your eternal father give good things to those who ask? You know what he said? I'll give you things quicker than you'll give your children things. I'll be better to you than you are to your children. Compared to my goodness, you look like an evil father. It was th this is not the God who's watching you, waiting for you to make a mistake, a wrong God. This is the God who's looking for somebody to be good to if they'll just listen to him. One of my favorite verses, I know they're all my favorite verses. 2 Samuel chapter 9 says this. Listen to him. Is there somebody out there that I can show the kindness of God to? You tell me what's on the heart of God. He's not looking for somebody to get in trouble. He's looking for somebody to be good to. He wanted to be good to this dumb redneck fisherman whose business was struggling. But how'd he do it? He didn't walk up to him and say, here, here's some money, Simon. What'd he do? He said, get your nets back in your boat. Go right over there and put them out. Why couldn't he just hand me the money? I don't know. Ask him when you get there. But there'll always be something he'll ask you to do 
so he can open heavens and windows over you. And it'll probably offend you, but if you can get over it, you'll be going, look at here, dear. Simon couldn't wait to get home that night and tell Mama, look at this check right here. God did that for him. I always wondered, listen carefully to me, I always wondered why God was so good to Simon all through that Bible. Simon was hot-tempered. I had somebody who said, how dare you talk so ugly about St. Peter? He was not a saint. He was like the rest of us. He, he was rough, but God did so many things for him, and I'm wondering, why? Why are you so good to this man? But you know what the answer is? Simon would do anything he said. Let me give you one of the, I bet you didn't know this was in the Bible. Matthew 17, listen to this. One day Simon goes up to Jesus. He said, I'm running short on cash. I don't have the money to pay my taxes. Could you help me pay my taxes? Well, you know, if you need to pay your taxes, you need to ask for help. And uh, all right, they're sitting there, they're in a room and they didn't carry money themselves. All 13, the 12 disciples, apostles and Jesus had a common money box. It was a box that all 13 of them kept their money in together. Who, who carried the money box? Anybody know? Judas carried the money box. And uh, all right, Simon needs help paying his taxes. Why didn't Jesus just say, Judas, hand me the box? Why didn't Jesus just open the box, take the money out and say, here, go pay your taxes? Why didn't he do it that way? That's the way I do it. What if his ways are not my ways? Listen to Matthew 17, 27. Jesus said to Simon, get your rod and reel. Go to the sea. Cast in a hook. The first fish you catch, look in his mouth. Take that money and go pay your taxes. Why do you do this to me? Why can't you just hand me the money out of your pocket? What's with the take your rod and reel, go catch a fish, money in the fish? I've caught thousands of fish. I ain't never seen nothing in their mouth except my hook. We ain't never had no money in there. Do, let me ask you a question. Now, I know we're, we get religious in church on Sunday, but doesn't that sound weird to you? You need money? So he says, well, go fishing. Hawk, I'll, I'll obey that command. Go fishing, and uh, the money will be in the fish's mouth. That don't sound weird to you. That's weird. You know why that sounds weird to me? Because he doesn't think like I think. His ways are above my ways. So Simon grabs his Shakespeare, here we go, goes in there to the sea and he's, he's fishing and, and, he's, and finally, you know, after three or four kids, catch him and pulls him up here, grabs that fish. He looked around first. Opens that fish's mouth and sure enough, there, that fish's mouth is full of money. Why is God like this? This ain't the God of the American church. This is the God of the Bible. And he's always doing stuff like this. I don't know about you, I love this kind of stuff. I just love it when he does crazy things. I love it when he just goes, do that right there. And I go, hot dog. This is going to be so much fun. And he, he just, he blesses people who aren't bothered by his craziness. And I say that with all respect. He will bless people who are not bothered by his craziness and his ways of doing things. Over and over you see this through scripture. All right. Have you ever said this before? Well, I think this is the way it ought to be done. You ever said that before? Let me show you what happens to people who say that. Turn with me to 2 Kings 5. I learned more from this passage right here. Matter of fact, he taught me from this passage, this is why churches don't work or why church is not working in your nation. 2 Kings chapter 5 is one of the craziest. I've had people say to me, I, I never saw this stuff in the Bible until you started showing it. Well, it's been in there 2,000 years. But this book is written to teach us how to live. This book is written, if you find 2 Chronicles, 1 2 Kings, 1 2 Samuel, it's right there in the Old Testament. All right, 2 Kings chapter 5. Let me tell you what's happening. I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with the geography. You ever heard of the country of Syria? All right, Syria is to the east, a border Israel to the east, just like this. They're side by side. Syria is a proxy for Iran right now. And there are raids coming out of Syria into Israel right here. All right. In 2 Kings chapter 5, at this time in history, what's going on is the Syrians are coming into Israel to raid them. Do you remember what happened last October when Hamas came into Israel, kidnapped people and killed them? That's exactly what's going on right here, but it's coming from the other side now. And the Syrian army is coming into Israel and killing people and kidnapping people. 
All right, there was a young teenage girl and the Syrian army kidnapped this girl, brought her back to, to Syria, and the commander of the Syrian army, his name was Naaman, he sees her and he takes her to be a servant to his wife. He takes her home with her. She's a, she's a, a hostage. So he takes her home. She becomes the servant to the chief of staff's wife. All, right, all of a sudden, this guy named Naaman, who's the commander in chief, he gets leprosy. Well, leprosy is external cancer. Cancer eats your body from the inside out. Leprosy gets on your skin, eats in. And I've, I've seen, my daughter worked in one of Mother Teresa's leper colonies in India for a while. And I've seen pictures of lepers. Their fingers have disappeared. Their nose disappears. It's a horrible way to die. He's got this. He's going to die. Well, this little girl that was captured from Israel, she says to her, uh, her boss, she says, uh, there's a preacher in my country that can heal leprosy. I wish he could get to that preacher so he could be healed of his leprosy. Well, that sounds... Number one, that sounds weird. You know, we sort of roll our eyes at these faith healers on the late night TV. We need to quit rolling our eyes. And we need to start believing what this book says. So Naaman hears this. He says, I'm going. So he gets permission from his king to go. And uh, he gets his entree. You know, the chief of staff don't ride on a mule. He gets this big group together and his entrees and he carries gold and silver and gifts and he goes, and he goes to Israel, and he finds out, finds out, so where's this preacher at? Well, the preacher's name is Elisha. He says, I'm going to his house. So he pulls up to his house with all his regalia and his entourage and all that. Let's look at what happened. Uh, verse 9. Naaman, who was the commander of Syrian army, went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go dip or wash in the Jordan seven times your flesh shall be restored to you. You'll be clean. All right, so he pulls up to this house. This is where the prophet lives. And the prophet has an, a little helper. Young guy's a helper. His name's Gehazi. And Gehazi comes out and said, yes, sir, could I help you? He said, <clears throat> I've come to be healed of this leprosy by this preacher that I heard about. He said, I'll be right back. You wait right here. So he leaves him on the front porch. He goes back to Elisha and he says, uh, this general's out here wanting to be healed of leprosy. And Elisha says, Tell him, go jump in the river. Do it seven times. Dip or jump, whichever word you like. So he says, all right. So he goes out there and he says, uh, my master said for you to go jump in the river seven times, the Jordan River. Go dip in the river seven times. That don't bother you. How many of you, if you had cancer and your doctor said, go jump in the lake? We've read this stuff so much, we've gotten too familiar with it. To tell somebody to jump in a river and dunk yourself seven times to heal cancer sounds dumb. Yay or nay? He will offend your head to test your heart to see if you'll listen to him so he can be good to you. Well, you think Naaman did. <laughs> He's just like us. Watch this. Verse 11, Naaman became furious. Whoa, 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 dude. You dying of cancer, you ain't got no right to be mad at nobody. He's furious. He went away and he said, I said to myself, you ever done that? I thought this is the way God would do it. I said to myself, he will surely come out and call on his God and wave his hand and heal my leprosy. I thought God would do it like this. Now he's mad. Can I ask you a question? Who's he mad at? Who's he offended by? He's offended by God. He's offended by the way God. This is, you know what this is so amazing to me? This is God's enemy. He's coming into God's land. He's capturing God's people and killing them. And yet God in his kindness wants to heal this man. I'm telling you, we serve a good God who shows mercy to those who don't deserve it. And now this guy's mad about the way God wants to do it. He's offended by God's way. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. So now he's in a romp and he's all in his emotions. He's all in his head. And he goes off on this. Have you ever done this before? You ever been off on a tirade and you got mad? You ever just been jabber jabbering when you get mad about something? Watch this. Verse 12. Are not the Abana and the far car of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He went away in a rage. He really mad now. You know what he said? I ain't jumping in your nasty mud hole. A nasty little river of yours. I got beautiful rivers. I'm going to jump in the river. I'll jump in the river at my house. And he's so mad now. Wait, wait a minute. He's dying. He ain't got no business being mad at nobody. He needs to listen. This guy's fixing to die when God would have helped him. 
Thank God for preachers. Next verse, uh, verse 13. His servant came near and spoke to him, said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? You know what he said, sir? If he'd asked you to give $100,000 to orphanage, you'd have done it. Won't you just jump in the river? Thank God for people that tell us, just do what the man says. So for some reason, he decided to, verse 14, he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a child, and he was healed. That man almost missed his blessing. He almost died when God wanted to help him. You know why he almost missed God's goodness? I thought God would do it this way. Then we better get off thinking about how he'll do this. I've had people come to me and say, could you talk to my wife and straighten her out? So why don't you tell me how he's supposed to fix your mess? No, no, no. Why don't you sit down and let me talk to you? Can you understand what he's saying here? God offended this man's intellect to help him. This man almost died after God was going to be good to him. How many things have we missed? Because it didn't make sense to us. Just do what the man says. Just listen to him and, and do what he says if we wouldn't be offended. Let's take a minute before we're done and let's do this. What are the two things Simon had to do to see his business turn around? He had to hear God speak to him and then he had to do what he said. What did Naaman have to do to be healed? He had to hear what God was saying, then he had to be healed. There was, everything in life comes down to hearing what he's saying and then doing what he says. And the blessing's on the other side. What are the two ways we hear God speak today? Through his word. He'll speak to us through his word and he'll speak to your heart. Then God still speaks today. I got friends that don't believe that. They're wrong. God still speaks to us today. He'll speak in your heart. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Uh, let's bring this down to where we live. Anybody ever done you wrong? Oh, you fuss about it all week on the telephone. Anybody ever done you wrong? I'm talking about real wrong. I'm not talking about cut you off and try. Anybody ever just stabbed you? Lied about you? Done you wrong? All right, what do you do when somebody does you wrong? What do you do? Number one, we're going to tell somebody. Amen or oh me? We won't get on the phone and tell somebody. We love to tell what people did to us, don't we? Number two, we're going, to straight, we're going to straighten them out. We're going to get them back. I ain't putting up with this crap. I'll stand up for myself. Isn't that, our, isn't that our way? Listen to me. You listen to me. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. Father, them people are stabbing me in the back and line about me. What do you want me to do? Real simple. I want you to forgive them. And I want you to bless them. And I want you to pray and ask me to be good to them. Anybody else up there I can talk to? <laughs> that offends my human nature that God would want me to be good to somebody that's been bad to me. But what happens if I obey Him? Number one, I ain't laying in the bed at night going, I'm sleeping like a baby. To be able to sleep is worth it to let it go. Every time we obey Him, something good happens. I can't tell you how many people through my 40 years of doing this were on psychiatric medicine, seeing a psychiatrist, terribly depressed, and they'd come talk to me and I would listen and I'd say, I know what the problem is here. Somebody had done them wrong. Maybe it was dad. Maybe it was a mate. Somebody had done them wrong and they were burning over it. They were so angry at them and they wouldn't turn it loose. And I would tell them, you can be free. You don't need the medication. You can be free and be happy and the depression will leave. Forgive them and bless them and ask God to be good to them and you'll sleep good tonight. I can't tell you how. Some people have done it and their lives were changed. Others have been so angry at me for even suggesting it. Uh, I'll give you one example. I had a lady one time, her brother had, her father owned a huge farm. Right before he died, when he wasn't in his right mind, her brother slipped in, wrote a new will, and had his father sign it, and he got everything. He, he stole the farm from the other siblings. And I noticed she struggled. She, had to, she was depressed and upset. She came to see me one day, and she was seeing a counselor. And, and uh, I poked around a little bit, and I, I saw the problem. I said, listen, you know what you need to do? You need to forgive your brother. Go see him and ask him to forgive you for hating him and bless him and tell him, 
you didn't take that farm from me. I give you my part. God bless you. I hope you do well with it here. I said, you need to do that. She got so angry at me for even suggesting it. Did I make that up? He will offend your head to see if you'll listen to him. And of course, she didn't listen to me. And then she committed suicide a year or two after that. Just so broken in mind. Dear ones, we have got to do it his way and listen to him. Uh, let me give you another one for where we live. Everybody needs money. Money is the one thing that ties us all together. And I many of you, once in a while we struggle with, as that song says, stuck in the middle where money gets tight. Sometimes we struggle with money. Well, listen, you can ask God. He's loaded. Y'all didn't know that. Malachi says he owns all the silver and all the gold. I get in financial trouble. I ask him for help. And uh, I say, Father, we're, we're a little tight on money here. I, I need money. I need money to pay bills. I need your help. And I acknowledge him. I'm listening to you. And uh, you know what he'll tell me to do? All he's got to do is write me a check. My way would be for me to go to the mailbox and find an anonymous check in the mail. That's a good way. I came up with that. He didn't. Do you know what he always says to me? Give money away. Uh, you misunderstand what I said. I didn't say I had a surplus. I, I'm in the red. I'm in the red. I need help. He says give money away. That don't make a lick of sense to give it away when you need it, does it? 2 Corinthians 9.10 <clears throat> He who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will multiply the seed you've sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. You know what he says there? I've given you money. You don't have enough right now, but I've given you money. <clears throat> he puts the money he gives us in two categories. What are they? Seed for sowing, bread for eating. Some of the money he gives me is for me to eat and spend on my family you know, buy food. But some of the money he gives me is not for eating, it's for sowing. God don't need my money. He's loaded. Why does he give me seed for sowing? The God who gives you seed for sowing and bread for food, not add, multiply. Multiply the seed you've sown. When you're in financial trouble, give money to somebody that needs it. What will he do every single time? Every single time. He will multiply back what you gave away. I'll give you one, one, one little incident. I've seen this happen over and over. You say, well, I, I, I just can't. I can't afford to give it away. Goodbye blessing. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. Uh, I used to listen to a guy on the radio years ago. I enjoyed listening to him. He's gone to heaven for several years now. He was a preacher in Texas. He had no education, so nobody let him preach. So him and his wife rented a used feed mill store. And they started their own church in a little feed mill store. And God blessed it. It grew and it grew. <clears throat> and it got to the place where they needed a new place. They were out of room. So he prayed. They had, a, they had a building fund. You know, building fund where you got some money to build. But there wasn't near enough in it. So he prayed. He said, we got to do something or turn people away. Help. I need your help. And God spoke to him and said, that little church near you whose building was damaged in the storm, take your building fund and give it to them. Well, that don't. No, 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 no. I need money. I, don't, I didn't say I needed to give. I need money. God's answer to him was give away what you do have. Give the building fund away to that guy right there. He said, I, I know how he is, so I did it. He said, some folks in my church didn't like it. You know, if you follow Jesus, hey, some folks are not going to like it. That's okay. He'll like it. And he said, I did it. And, and uh, what do you think God did when he did something that dumb? Gave the money in the building. What do you think he did? Well, he's not the pastor anymore. He's gone to heaven. His son's the pastor now. And this morning, that church is meeting in the largest church building in America that was miraculously given to them by God. I'm telling you, if you'll just listen to what the man says and do what he says, even if you don't like it, this is when good things happen. Good things come our way. Let me quit by saying this. <clears throat> Why was Simon so blessed? Why did God do so much for him every single day? Because he didn't care what the man said. I'm going to do it blessed is he who's not offended by me I want you to learn something he is not mad at you because you're not behaving he's looking for a way to be good to you but he's good to us through obedience alright let me give you one quick illustration we done is anybody here a champion a wrestling fan y'all any wrestling fans in here oh we're too uppity for that y'all too I ain't got no wrestling fans in here well I grew up loving wrestling because I'm, I'm wrestling started in Charlotte where I grew up at the park center 
and you had to, and my grandma, she lived with us. Now, but if she loved wrestling, she'd pull her chair right up to that little black and white TV and she'd wrestle the chair while she was watching wrestling. And if you talked during wrestling, pop, she'd smack you because don't interfere with wrestling. She loved wrestling and she'd get mad if hers were losing. Well, <clears throat> my favorite team was uh, Johnny Weaver and George Becker. And they were always getting whooped by the masked bolos. And I'd, I'd pull for Johnny Weaver and George Becker and we'd go watch them at the park center. It's not like it is now. Back then, it was just a bunch of old fat guys hugging each other in leotards, about all it was. So we're watching wrestling, and uh, my best friend lived about a mile down the road in an apartment complex. Him and his mom, his dad had died young. And uh, I'd go see him. Well, one day, Johnny Weaver moves in to an apartment beside him two doors down. Oh, we, we just thought, this, this is heaven. Johnny Weaver lives over here. And, you know, he was the star of the show back then. Well, one day we're out, uh, me and him, I was spending the night with him. He was 17. I wasn't driving. I was 15. Had a little Volkswagen bug tight with the engine in the rear end. And we're out there washing that car one evening. And Johnny Weaver comes pulling up in his car. I forget what he drove, but it was very nice. So he gets out of the car and says, hey, Mr. Weaver. And uh, he says, hey, boys. He's, and he's walking up the steps. He says, uh, y'all wash my car when you get done. Then he went in his house. So we got done. I said to my buddy, let's wash his car. He said, we ain't got to. I said, wash the man's car. We can go to school and tell everybody we did it. Come on, let's wash his car. So we drugged the hose down there and we washed his car off good as we could. Went in the house for the night, went to bed. We got up the next morning, came back out. Mr. Weaver's car was gone. And uh, this Volkswagen, it had a racing steering wheel. I don't know why, because 30 miles an hour is as fast as it'd go. <laughs> but it had little spokes and little holes in the spokes. And there was a $10 bill rolled up and stuck in one of those spokes. Now, that don't mean nothing to you. We're talking 1974. You know what two boys could do with $10 in 1974? You'd go to McDonald's twice. <laughs> all the tokens you could play at the arcade for a day and all the beer two boys could drink for a day. $10. <laughs> a big meal was 95 cents at McDonald's. And man, we had the biggest... Back in a car wash was a dollar. You, only, you paid a dollar for a car. He paid us $10. So we partied all day, had the best time. Come on that evening. And as we pulled in there, Mr. Weaver's car was sitting there in the parking lot. I made a beeline to his door, knocked on it. He came to the door. I said, man, you, I, we appreciate the money. You didn't have to. He said, glad to help you. But I said, uh, anything else you need done around your house? I said, like, do you need, like, like, you want to vacuum? I know how to vacuum. I said, I can carry your trash up. I clean your toilet. Anything you need? He said, no. I, I said, well, if you need something, you know who to call. I'm your man. You know what I found out? That man pays crazy money for the silliest little things. And I made up my mind, if he wants his back scratched, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I don't care what he wants, I'm going to do it. I was lied to when I was young. I was told that God Almighty is stern and he's mad at people who don't do right. And he's watching you. Well, I might as well go on to hell because I was one of the worst ones there was. You know what I found out reading this book? They lied to me. He's not mad. He's good. And when I find out how good he is to those who will listen to him and do what he says, no matter how crazy it sounds, you know, one of my regular prayers is all the time now, you need anything done? Just tell me something. Just say something. Tell me to do something and watch what I do. I'll jump on it. Listen, I'll jump on it like a, like a spring breeze on a windmill. Whatever he wants, I'm going to do it. Because you know what I've learned? He blesses those who will listen to him and obey him. Let's pray together. Father, I want to praise you and thank you for your goodness. I love your word. I love your truth because I love you. Thank you for your goodness. Father, there's not a one of us that aren't needy people. We're impressed with how smart we are. We're impressed with how strong we are. We are needy people and we need your help. And you created us to need you. You created us to be good to us. You created us to bless us. I will be a father to them and they'll be sons and daughters to me. I pray in the name of Jesus this morning that what these people have heard this morning from your word will roll around in their souls like a marble in a shoebox for a long time. And they'll make up their minds. I don't care what he says to me. I'm going to do it so I can see the blessing that he gives. You would heal our hearts. You'd bring such peace and joy into our lives. You'd give us the greatest homes. You'd open doors for us. You would pay our bills. You would make life, we would live astonished. God is in my life if we would listen to you and not be offended by you. I want to thank you and praise you for your wonderful ways today. 
And the great prayer of David in the psalm, teach me your ways that I might know you. I trust you for that. Dear Jesus, anybody in here today that's never followed you, you're coming back to earth one day. I think it's very soon. Time will stop. Business will stop. The courtrooms will stop. And the king is coming back. I want everybody to be ready and everybody to follow you in this life. I pray you draw people to yourself now before we leave. If they've never trusted you and put you first place in their lives, you belong in first place above everything else. Friends, while we're praying, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you've never made him number one in your life, there's a place in your life where you've got to say, I surrender all. I'm going to follow Jesus. He's going to be number one in my life. From this day forward, God is my Father, and I'm going to follow him. And you do that through the cross. Jesus died on a cross to bring you back to his Father to bring you back to your creator. But you have to make a decision. There has to be a place in your life where you say, right there, that's when I accepted Christ as my Savior and my Lord, and I put him first place in my life. You have to do that. So I'm going to give you a chance to do that as we pray right there where you're seated. A simple prayer. It's the heart that matters. The words don't matter. The heart always matters with him. But if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, Make him the Lord of your life and follow this man and know the greatest life possible. Great lives come from following Jesus. Pray a simple prayer seated right there where you're at. Something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on a cross in my place. I believe you're coming back to earth one day. On this day, I choose you as my savior. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I turn from my rebellious life. In the name of Jesus, from this day forward, you are my Savior. You're my Lord. You're my best friend. You're the love of my life. You're everything to me from now on. On this day, I follow you. I may not understand it, but I've decided to follow you with all my heart. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for speaking to me. And I pray this prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. You in. You one of us now. And we're so thankful for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God bless you. I love you. See you next time.